All right. Um, <laughs> see, I haven't done this side of it. I'm not used to doing the interviewing side. I'm used to being the interviewee. Oh, it'll be um, a challenge for both of us. So, so this is going to be fun. <laughs> um, first off, uh, I'm Chris Bureau. Uh, I am the director of Bird Recovery International, a uh, small nonprofit that works with parrots and trying to improve the um, the methodology of how we put parrots back into the wild, prove the science of that. And we have a blue and gold macaw project that we are doing here in Brazil. Uh, we are in Brazil. Um, the birds are flying around. We have some baby birds that we're training, and they are now flying uh, around the property, becoming wild birds as we speak. Anyway, I'm here with the person who owns the property that we are doing this on. And so we thought we would do a little quick interview here and kind of uh, introduce uh, the world to um, this wonderful person that's letting us do this on his property. So tell us about yourself. Tell us your name. And <laughs> well, first of all, thank you very much for being here. It's a pleasure to, to know you and know the project a little bit more. Uh, it's very fun to be part of this with you and, and Roberto. So I'm really glad to, to have you here and be speaking with, with you today. Oh, so my name is Joao. Here. <laughs> so I'm, my name is Joao. Uh, I'm, I'm Brazilian, of course. And um, I'm, I'm, I live in Sao Paulo I'm a, and I work as a, a, a CFO in a healthcare company. I have much little to do with the with farms and the countryside, but I always love to, to uh, the animals and uh, nature, and, and I would like to take part of something bigger in this sense. And the first thing that, that Roberto just teach me uh, that we could make something out of this property and make something uh, that would be good for the nature, good for birds, and 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 uh, just dive in the project because I I think it would be very very nice for me. So how do you like the idea of, of having macaws, wild macaws, flying around on your property? Oh, macaws, they're, they're beautiful, first of all, and they are so, so happy animals, animals that we don't see anymore here in this place. You got to see them fly around a little bit today, Oh, you? it was very nice, very nice. It was beautiful. And uh, maybe this haven't happened here in this region in about 50 years. Mm -hmm. And um, being able to reintroduce these animals back in the, in the wild and see your job here, training the birds, this is something that um, it's once, once in a lifetime to, to, to see. It's, it's very, I'm very happy, very happy to learn about the project a little bit more. That's a once in a lifetime opportunity for me as well. <laughs> I've been working on trying to get this to happen for like 12 years now. And it took us two years just to get the permit. So uh, then it was a matter of where do we do it? And, and then, you know, Umberto said, well, I've got the place. And uh, the owner is all excited about it. And we're like, <laughs> cool, awesome. And now we're here having a great time. And, um, yes, I think this is the, just the, the beginning. Um, I see this property as a, as a place that we can uh, establish uh, uh, the florist uh, again and, and make the, uh, all the, 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 the bad things that humans made to the nature in this region because this is a very uh, uh, used region for, for crops and sugar cane and uh, the, the, so, uh, the, the environmental consciousness in, for the Brazilians is something that uh, is just starting and I think we have so much to do. So I uh, would really be uh, uh, happy to see this place as a, a conservationist project and making part of something bigger. Well, I, I'm glad to hear that because one of the things we want to do is we want to be able to show that we don't have to be in conflict, okay? The sugar cane is a huge part of, you see the sugar cane uh, uh, fields behind us here. And, but there's a whole lot of areas on the perimeters of the sugarcane fields and, and there's lots of areas that we could plant more trees and, and the kind of trees that the macaws can live on. Mm -hmm. And so like this piece of property right here, we have tree, these, these little berry things right here on this tree right here are something that the birds eat. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so uh, they're going to be learning about coming up here and eating out of these trees and there's several different types of foods that they can eat on this property, but we can also add palm trees. You see palm trees on this property? Not so much. So we can plant palm trees here, and it's one of the things that Bird Recovery International wants to do is we're going to plant like 7,000 trees in this area for these birds. As their population increases, um, they'll have more food sources for them as the population grows. So, but the idea is to not be in conflict with the agriculture that's here, but to work with it because there's a whole lot of areas that we can still plant trees in and have this wildlife, but still have the benefits because we all need the agriculture. 
Sure. It's not like we don't uh, want to work with them. We believe that, uh, you know, we're not at odds. Mm -hmm. It's a matter of working together, which we think is very, very doable. Oh, for sure, for sure. It's where the people get the jobs. So, yeah, uh, jobs uh, and food? For us and food, yeah. <laughs> really. It's important. <laughs> yeah, so, so much. And, um, but uh, this is uh, uh, something, uh, it's very new. Um, and maybe I, I would like to ask you, sure. how big this can go? Uh, how, how far can we go with this, with this project and starting with the Macaws? But what, what, what else can we try to do here? What, how, how big this can go? Look, it, it, there's a whole lot of areas around uh, Brazil that the Macaws used to live in that they don't live anymore. And so all of those areas we could be working on trying to repopulate with macaws and, and plant more trees in those areas. But then there's other species besides just macaws. There's conures, there's amazons, there's, there's a whole bunch of different species that we can use these same methods on. So the kind of sky's the limit of what we can do with this. There's an awful lot of room to grow and benefit the environment and the animals, uh, but also humans, because humans benefit from having these animals around as well. I mean, I. You looked pretty happy today when you were watching them fly around. Yes, yes, it was. Yeah, so that's a, it's something that's new for me. Event. It's not something that, that happened on my day-to-day -day basis. So uh, I'm, a, I'm a city guy. I work in, uh, in, in, a, in a, one of the largest cities in Brazil, this is Sao Paulo. So um, just how does to, it make you feel when you see them flying around? Uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's totally different because the lessons that you made today, the, the way the, the, the birds think and the, the way they, they act, and why it's important to have some habits to the, to, to, to the birds and the things that you teach them to fly. It, it's, it's so uh, uh, educative. So it's something that I think everyone should, should have learned this before. And um, today we're talking so much about environmental, social and governmental things and ESGs. The companies are always trying to make some projects that have an impact. So uh, learning more about this, I think that uh, it's something that everyone should 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 have the taste and today I have a little bit of taste and I saw the birds flying it and it was so amazing it was really beautiful really beautiful I, I'm hopeful that what we're doing will play into the ESG thing because in a very positive way you know there's a lot of people who are very unhappy about some of the ESG concepts you know, mm -hmm. this whole woke um, you know not everybody's thrilled about some of the social justice issues that are being pushed on people through companies and a lot of companies are losing money because of that mm -hmm. um, you know Disney and Coke of Coca-Cola have lost a ton of money over this for just to name a couple but there's other ESG components like what we're doing that is not nobody's gonna be complaining about this this mm -hmm. is gonna be something that people are gonna be happy about rather than having creating a division in people uh, so I'm hoping that we can attract funding for this kind of a project through uh, that avenue because the ESG thing is something that's in our world today mm -hmm. and you know if we can do this in a way and, and, and help the companies improve their ESG scores by doing something that's environmentally good without creating the the political backlash mm -hmm. I think that's a that, that presents an opportunity for conservation projects like this to, to build a growth Sure. and provide a good service for the, the community that way. And speaking a little bit about, about funding and ESG and companies, uh, one, one question that I haven't made you yet, and I'd like to learn a little bit more is, uh, talk a little bit more about your organization, the group that you make part, the group that Roberto is taking part as well. Uh, who are you guys? Uh, Bird Recovery International is a, a nonprofit organization. It's a 501c3 uh, organization in the United States in good standing. Uh, we're small. Um, I've funded most of it uh, through my own pocket because um, we haven't done much because it's been hard to uh, get the permits to do these kind of projects. It's taken us 12 years to get it this far. Um, I've probably put, I don't know, $60,000 of my own money in it. But anyway, our goal is to, you know, we're scientists basically or we're professionals. And like, you know, I'm, I'm, I guess I am a scientist now because I'm peer reviewed published, so it makes me a scientist. But um, I'm a professional animal trainer. Um, who's really enthusiastic about improving the science of how to put these animals back. Because I know that there are deficiencies in part of the science for how to put the animals back. And so that's something I feel like I can contribute to. And so Bird Recovery International is a, um, just a handful of people that is um, trying to do projects uh, that involve improving the population stability like these animals, you know, establishing them here, but also helping them be 
not just here, but having the resources to function and survive and thrive here um, and improve the science of how we do that at the same time. And it's, um, we have a website, birdrecoveryinternational.com, um, palmsforparrots.com uh, is about the tree planting program that we're doing where people can plant trees just so they can buy a, you know, they can plant a palm tree for like $5. Uh, they'll plant the seed for five dollars or a plant a one-year-old seedling for twenty-five dollars that helps support the planting of the trees but it helps support the projects mm -hmm. uh, and so that's one of the things we're, we're looking to do with that um, you can follow the progress of this project on facebook uh, go to the bird recovery international facebook page where that's where i post photos and videos of the project as it's progressing um, that's uh, most everybody involved has PhDs except for me. <laughs> <laughs> so it's uh, it's something that is uh, you know we don't make a lot of uh, publicity out of Bird Recovery International. It's not something that we've tried to do at this point, but uh, I think we will. You'll see us doing more of that as we have the projects like this uh, maturing. Because I'm one of those people that feels uncomfortable about asking the public to help fund us when we haven't done anything yet, mm -hmm. right? I mean, we've done a little bit, you know, we've, we've published a peer-reviewed paper about doing this. We've funded uh, a project in, in Peru where they were taking and pulling the babies that would normally die because mom and dad don't feed, mm -hmm. you know, they feed the first one and the rest of them die. And so we pulled those babies and we fed them hand feeding and we gave them back to the parents and then the parents continued to feed them. They raised all three or four of them. Um, and they don't normally do that. So it was a very successful project, but that was in line with our view of supporting the animals so that the animals, you know, there's a lot of different ways you can do parrot conservation. You know, you can buy land, um, you can do studies where you study, you know, how big they get at what speed and, and this kind of thing, but it doesn't really help the animals survive when you do that. Uh, that type of study. So we're, we're interested in things that actually help the animals um, first off be reintroduced to an area but also to thrive and stabilize the population. I, I'm a firm believer that if you wait until there's only 15 of them then you've waited too long. Mm -hmm. Okay, We need to be doing something for them when there's 1,500 of them or 15,000 of them and not let the numbers get so low where it becomes critical. So that, that way it takes a lot more effort, a lot more money to save a species is down to 10 or 15 when you can do a whole lot cheaper, easier, higher chance of success when you work with those animals uh, before you let it get that low. So that's the kind of projects that I'm uh, looking for. And, and, and you said something about the, the, the scientific part of the project. And uh, what you're trying to do here is something really new. Uh, nowhere else in the world uh, someone tried to get uh, uh, animals that were in danger or not any uh, uh, more available in, in the region and reintroduce as a wild a wild animal, isn't so it? What's unique about this project is there have been there have been other projects that took birds raised in captivity, but they were usually raised in government program breeding programs. Mm -hmm. Whereas this program is actually taking birds out of the pet trade mm -hmm. because that was really important to us because there's been a belief in in scientific communities and government agencies that the birds in the pet trade have no conservation value. Mm -hmm. Well, that's that's only true because nobody's done projects with those pet birds so to demonstrate that. And that's also true because at this point, they didn't have the techniques to use the birds raised from the pet trade. And I believe that that's a really, really important component of this because it's very possible that the only birds we're going to have left uh, in the not too distant future are the birds that we have in the pet trade because we have a reserve population. Uh, so if you, if you don't have the birds to put back, you can't do a conservation release project and repopulate the area. You have to have birds to put back. And so the pet trade is a fantastic source of reserve population birds, mm -hmm. right? And we need to learn methods to use those birds because there's not enough zoos in the world to protect the thousands and thousands. There's like 10,000 species of birds. And the U.S. is what, 200 zoos? I don't know how many Brazil has, but there's, say they have the same amount. So mm -hmm. maybe we have 400 zoos. How do you protect 10,000 species with only 400 zoos? You can't. So, you know, we can um, 
utilize that reserve population if we have the techniques to do that. And the other thing that's really important is that the pet trade creates enthusiasm for conservation. Mm -hmm. It creates enthusiasm for uh, valuing these animals. When people have pets like this, they become very attached to them and then they want to support them in the wild. Whereas the birds that don't have a pet presence tend to just be allowed to go extinct and nobody seems to care. And so I think it's really, really important that we um, view the pet trade as an asset rather than um, as a problem because uh, without them, I think we're going to lose these species uh, permanently. So mm -hmm. having them in captivity is really important to me. Mm -hmm. And using them from the pet trade is really important to me. Um, anyway, um, <laughs> I don't know what else to ask you here. Um, no, I have so little to ask for me because I'm, I'm just a, a passive a lover a, a, of this project of, of, of Roberto. Um, I just met you, but I really believe that we're going to be good friends and you can count on me and to make this project grow in Brazil, to make this whole area back to the, to the, the way it was in the past with a lot of trees and the biodiversity back. So. Uh, you can count on me and you have a friend here and uh, I believe that we're going to make the uh, Bird Rescue International great. <laughs> I'm, I'm looking forward to it because the reality is Umberto, myself and Don Brightsmith, the three uh, key players in this particular project, we have, the, we have the enthusiasm, we have the expertise, but it, we can't do all this by ourselves. We have to have public support because we've only got so much money out of our own pockets. And mm -hmm. what they always say in science is you're never supposed to use your own money to do <laughs> science. That's not supposed to be the way it works. But sometimes if you don't put your own money into it, then it doesn't happen in the first place. You know? It's so a venture. You need to start it. Some, somewhere. That's right. So you got to start somewhere. And this is, this is hopefully going to open some doors. And um, I'm extremely excited to, to be able to work with you in the future. And I'm delighted to meet you here. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah.